Good morning. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday in Lent. We've been having some technical problems this morning, so we've been running back and forth, and we're posting to a place we don't usually post to. So I just need to take a deep breath and um, hope um, and trust our tech folks who are amazing. And um, this week begins our midweek programming, so I invite you to join us on Wednesday nights for a meal, a short Bible study, and a worship service. Everything will be held downstairs in the fellowship hall, so please come and be part of that each Wednesday night throughout Lent. I was checking on an, the devotionals and the cards in the back. There's still some. If you see that there's only one, don't hesitate to take it. We're, we'll produce more. <laughs> I just didn't want stacks of things that we then had to throw away and kill all sorts of trees. But grab what you need, and if you know a friend who could use it, please share that with them. We will make more. Not a problem. Council meets on Tuesday. But I don't have any other things I made note of, but are there things you need? Yes, Don? I noticed some inspections were done before council this morning. Oh, I, that got... I posted everything on Wednesday before we needed to change things. Yes, council will meet at 5.30 downstairs in the fellowship hall. So thank you for catching that. I didn't have a chance this morning to go back and proof it to see what had changed since Tuesday when I loaded the PowerPoint. <laughs> Others this morning. Well, then I invite you to take just a few moments. Actually... I forgot that this is a little bit different. So we're going to back up because I messed up. <laughs> Please join me in our call to worship. Come in, feel your feet on the floor, settle your worries, take a deep breath. Dust the cobwebs from your ears, relax the tension in your jaw. For Christ is here. God never stops seeking us. We have been found. Let us find God in return. Let us worship the God of deep waters. Amen. That call to worship and different parts of our service are from our series on Wandering Heart this, Advent, or this Lenten season. So do, I now invite you to truly take that deep breath and to feel your feet on the floor and prepare your hearts for worship. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join me in the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. In our scripture passage for today, we read about Jesus calling Peter to be a disciple. In the story, Peter is in the presence of the divine for quite some time before he realizes it. Jesus crawls into Peter's boat. He tells him to head toward deep water. Together, they let the nets down. And it is only when the boat threatens to sink due to extreme abundance of fish that Peter turns to Jesus and truly sees who's in his boat. Sometimes we miss what's right in front of us. Fortunately, Christ keeps crawling into our boats anyhow. So join me in the prayer of confession, not out of fear, but out of a desire to finally see who's right in front of us. Let us pray. Loving God, you call us by name. You join us in the deep waters of life. You invite us to drop our nets and follow you. And yet more often than we'd like to admit, we are like Peter. Over and over again, 
We stand slack-jawed in surprise to find you in our midst. Forgive us for drowning out your voice with our own. Forgive us for assuming that we can tackle deep waters by ourselves. Forgive us for forgetting that you will never stop climbing into our boat. Turn our hearts, our minds, and our spirits toward you, for you are the Lord our God, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Friends, Peter didn't exactly make a good first impression when Jesus got into his boat. He questioned dropping his nets as they hadn't caught any fish all night. He was oblivious to who Christ was for quite some time. And once he realized the divinity standing in his boat, he quickly deemed himself unworthy. And even still, Jesus called Peter a disciple and a friend. Church family, hear and believe this good news. You can make a thousand bad impressions. You can make every mistake in the book, roll your eyes and assume you know better. And even still, Christ forgives you, claims you, and continues to seek your heart. That's the good news of the gospel. Rest, celebrate, and trust in that. Amen. We open singing together what feast of love. <coughs> The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. For our Kyrie this day, we are using the Kyrie that is in setting 10, uh, um, set to a hymn tune. So please join me in our Kyrie, have mercy on us, Lord.
Let us pray. Creator God, you hear everything. You hear the rush of the wind through the trees. You hear babies cry. You hear the crickets chirping, our silent prayers, and laughter around tables. You hear it all. We don't need that same capacity, but we do need to hear your word, O oh God, for we cannot live on bread alone. So today we pray, give us the ability to truly listen. Give us the ability to listen with our hearts. And may the truth revealed in your scripture today change us. With hearts full of gratitude, we pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. It is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. 
Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. And when, he had done the, when they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were breaking, beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled their boat so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for from now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Well, this past Wednesday night, which was Ash Wednesday, I'm going to move this down a little bit or somewhere because I keep hitting it. Whoa, can we maybe turn that down a little bit maybe? Because I just got some pretty nasty feedback. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Anyways, on Ash Wednesday, we started our series, A Wandering Heart, Figuring Out Faith with Peter. And we're going to continue with that series throughout Lent and even into a few weeks after Easter. And as we do that, you will see things appearing around here to help us think together about the journey Peter takes to faith and how he walks with Jesus and how that might inform our lives as well. You will also notice that each week that has kind of its sub-theme is a snippet from the very familiar hymn, Come Thou Found. So if you find yourself humming that in the midst of a sermon or announcements, you have a reason to. They put it there. Also, that song is going to be showing up in different ways throughout our Lenten time. It's not showing up anywhere today because I had some uh, recording issues. But be aware and maybe be intrigued by how God might be using a familiar hymn to work in your lives this Lent. The peop one of the pastors who wrote much of the material we'll be using said when she came across that hymn, she said, it felt like Peter wrote this song himself. Now, he didn't, but you, know, you always get those songs that feel like they're really right from your heart, and at least Files thought, felt that that was come now found for Peter. As we enter into Peter's journey, we'll get to watch the story of Jesus unfold through the eyes of a very normal human being who's trying to figure it all out, just like each of us are. Now, you might be put off a little bit when you think about this being called wandering, because that often signals that a person doesn't know where they're going and they could actually be lost. So when we talk about wandering in faith in the same sentence, you might hear that as, well, Peter didn't have faith or that he had lost his faith. But I invite you to think about it a little bit differently. Because I know when I hear, first hear the word wandering, I think back to when I was really young and we were living in Oklahoma for a couple years. And one of the things we do, or at least on some Saturdays, is go wandering around the kind of rural places outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Because my dad liked to go shopping in like the little fruit stands and find places. And inevitably, as we wandered, we got lost. And usually with less than a half a tank of gas. And this from a man who swore you never brought a car home without, with less than a quarter of a tank. Here we were often in the middle of nowhere with virtually no gas. I never realized how much pack that had on me until I was riding with some friends. I think it was in college or maybe it was when I was first at seminary. And we got lost. And I said, oh, we can't be lost. We have more than a half a tank of gas. 
And the whole car went. And I'm like, oh, sorry, never mind. <laughs> Family trauma. <laughs> so I'm going to invite you, when you think about a wandering heart, to think more about it as not distance from God, but as a metaphor that helps us remember that faith is a constant journey. And there's surprises. And there's new things to explore. That faith ebbs and flows. And in the midst of it, as we read Peter's story, he keeps going throughout all of it. Even when he gets knocked down a few times, ultimately, in Peter's story, we are reminded that God loves imperfect people. In fact, time and time again, that's precisely who God calls and claims, which is good news for all of us, because we're as imperfect as Peter is. So, like I said, today we meet Peter in the ordinariness of his life. He's a Galilean fisherman, running a business with his father and business partners. And one of the things that's always jumped out to me in this account is Jesus' words to Peter and how Peter responds. Truth be told, Peter is a better man than I would have been, so to speak. I mean, don't you really hate it when somebody who knows nothing about your job thinks they know your job better and, can, and goes to tell you exactly how to do your job? Because that, to me, is what Jesus and Peter first get into. Jesus is not a fisherman. He's a land lover. He's from Nazareth. He knows the carpentry business. He's not from Galilee, fishing in the lake and knowing how you in loads. And yet, he jumps into a boat and tells Peter how to fish, the guy who's done it for a living. And I think about Peter. I mean, it's one thing to agree to let Jesus get in your boat and use it kind of as a podium to address an entire audience, but it's another to listen to Jesus about fishing advice. Why Peter even listens to him amazes me. And perhaps that's part of what Jesus wanted Peter and now us to understand. God's ways don't always make sense to us. Sometimes they're counterintuitive. Sometimes they're cumbersome. They're inconvenient. And it might just take a whole lot of work to follow them with no specific promise of success. Peter didn't know he was going to get a catch, even though he, he got the nets wet again. He put the boat back out. And so each time God calls us, we have to decide whether we're willing to listen and take the risk of doing what we hear God asking us to do or to say no. And like Noah experienced when building that ark, People may think we're crazy for doing what God has placed on our hearts. And boy, do they love telling you how crazy you are. It takes a strong faith, courage, and conviction at times to keep following Jesus. That day in the boat by the Sea of Galilee, Peter chose to listen to Jesus, even when it sounded like he doubted it would lead to anything. Other than time and effort, what did he have to lose? But maybe, just maybe, Peter wasn't granting Jesus' request blindly. This wasn't G Peter's first encounter with Jesus. You might remember that we read this text, kind of, a few weeks ago, but from Mark. And what happens right before this is Jesus is in, at least in Mark, Jesus is in the synagogue, has taught, and then he goes and he heals Peter's mother-in-law. So Peter has seen Jesus already perform a miracle. And for him personally. But then that raises another question. If Peter had already witnessed Jesus performing a miracle, why does he initially question Jesus' command to drop his nets? I get that he was tired and everything, but still. Wouldn't he have thought, well, if Jesus healed my mother-in-law, 
he must have something really spectacular under his belt right now. That doesn't seem to be the case. It's more like he's placating someone he respects without truly believing he can do what he says. Now, you don't actually need to raise your hand here because I don't want anybody embarrassing themselves. So th think of this as like a rhetorical question. <laughs> but how many of you have ever experienced a God moment? I would hope that most of you have at one time or another in your life. But how long did that memory stay fresh in your mind? When you got back to your normal life and when things got overwhelming, was it the first thing that shot into your head? Maybe it was, but more likely not. We humans forget so easily. There's only, if you will, so many, so many neural pathways in our brains and we can't always seem to access the ones we want in a split second. But God doesn't hold that against us. God doesn't say, well, I gave you one miracle, what more do you want? Also, God doesn't move on and say, where's the next disciple who will remember what I've done? Jesus providing this miraculous catch of fish reminds us of the tenaciousness of God. Through the Holy Spirit, God continues to call, sanctify, and keep us in the true faith. We are not left to our own to try and get it right. We don't have to do this faith journey on our own. Matter of fact, more times than not, when you try to do it alone, we end up sinking ourselves and perhaps missing that miraculous catch that God intends for us. So Peter's now experienced Second miracle at Jesus' hands. But this time he resists the work of Jesus. He falls down on his face. It's like he wants nothing to do with this Jesus. Why do you think he's so resistant? Does he feel unworthy to receive this gift that he didn't really work for? Is he afraid that there could be repercussions from the Roman government? And that this abundant catch of fish might actually lead to trouble, like more taxes and fines for his business. Now, before you write that last one off, realize that the fishing business back then worked differently than what we understand. Fishing was part of the embedded economy of the day. And like everything else, it was under the oppressive control of the Roman government especially depending upon who your local governor was, who in Peter's case, that was Herod Antipas. And I know we all love to complain about taxes. Haven't you heard a lot about that? Mm -hmm. They had taxes then. America did not invent taxes. And under Herod's authority, he could arbitrarily impose a tax. What often happened in the fishing industry is that he required fishermen to pay what you might call in kind, and I don't mean by you know, giving them fish, but based on what you catch, that's how much your tax was. So larger catch, more tax. And that was in, in addition to a rental fee or what we might call a fishing license and furthermore, local fishermen were required to pay a harbor fee. So this tremendous catch of fish that looked like a windfall could actually end up costing the Zebedee, what I call the Zebedee outfitters, <laughs> quite a bit of money. Could Peter have been thinking about all this as he stared at that catch of fish and then back to Jesus? Sometimes God's work in our world clash. Or maybe Peter is overcome by what we may call these days awe. 
He's used to living in scarcity, and so Jesus' abundance is jarring, unnatural, and downright scary. If he had doubts before about who this Jesus really was, those have all been washed away today. And like so many people of faith before him, he feels unworthy to even be in Jesus' presence, let alone accept this gift of abundance. And that might have something to do, not just with the actions, but with Peter's words as well. If you think about what Jesus' first preached message was, in basically all the Gospels, it is repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance forces us to look at ourselves and to see where and how we have fallen short how we have not lived up to what God's word asks of us or what God desires for us. And we are confronted with our own shortcomings and rebellion, and we are challenged to see our missteps and invited to take responsibility for them. Those may be holy times of being in the presence of God, but they can also be overwhelmingly scary. And we see how unworthy we are of what God gives us. We get why Peter does what so many other biblical characters do when confronted by the divine. Fall on your face and ask to get out of there as quickly as possible. Part of our faith journey is having the courage to stay in those uncomfortable places and participate in God's work. Over the years, I had heard stories about people being awoken by God. And i got to admit, I kind of doubted whether they were true. But then it happened. It's been a few years ago. Just to give you a time frame, I still owned a waterbed. When all of a sudden, middle of the night, popped wide awake. And I did the usual inventory of why am I awake at this hour? Did I need to go to the bathroom? No. Was I hungry or thirsty? No. Was I going to throw up? No. So why was I awake? And then I had this overwhelming urge to pray. And so laying there in my nice, warm, cozy waterbed, I prayed for probably close to an hour. And most of that time was prayers of confession. And I also remembered folks who I knew were going through some tough times. Moments after I uttered that word, amen, I fell back asleep and slept quite soundly until my alarm went off and it was time to get ready to go to work. God had burst into my normal work-a-day world, and it was a really odd time for that to happen. It isn't that often how God does it. So a couple questions for you to think about this morning as you reflect on how Jesus, who sought Peter, is working in your life in the way Peter responded to Jesus. Has there been a time in your life when you have been offered an abundant gift, whether from God or from others? Did you feel any urge to resist it? And if so, why? How by Peter's encounter with Jesus in today's text help you the next time such an event happens. How do you respond to a God who is filled with abundance when it's so easy to look around and, also, and just see what we don't have? I place them in your hands and your hearts this morning. 
and invite you in a time of reflection this week. Please pray with me. Holy God, we read the accounts of how you sought out people like Peter, did miraculous things for him, and then invited him to follow you. It's amazing. It's inspiring. And Lord, quite frankly, it's scary. We're not sure we could do what Peter did. Yet you remind us that each of our journeys of faith is unique. You meet us where we are like you met Peter at the lake shore. Give us the courage to follow you, to trust your lead, and to keep bringing in the nets you fill to abundance. Help us not to resist your gifts and show us how to share those gifts with those around us. We ask all things, O oh God, as they're in accord with your will, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. to stand as you were able as we confess our faith this day using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now turn our hearts to prayer this day, praying for all according to their needs. God of truth, the ark of your church has room for many expressions of faith. We give thanks for the voices that challenge and awaken your people, especially that of Martin Luther, renewer of the church, whom we commemorate this day. Help us to hear you when you seek us out through the voices of the faithful. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is God, our maker, 
You remember your covenant with the earth and its inhabitants. Rescue communities and creatures hurting from natural disaster. Preserve species and habitats endangered by carelessness and disregard. Heal the land. Hear us, O God. God, our light, you know our weaknesses. Free all who govern from the temptations of power. Sustain all who work for human rights in every nation. Give wisdom and discernment to those who have been called into leadership positions. Hear us, O oh God. Great. God, our help, you care for your beloved children. Comfort those who are grieving, ill, afraid, in pain, or despair. Feed hungry people living in food deserts. Protect any at risk from exploitation or abuse. Hear us, O God. He is great. God, our home, you gather your people. Grant us health and safety as we assemble. Keep us mindful of any who are homebound, hospitalized, convalescing, or traveling. Especially this day we remember before you, Sharon and Joe. We pray for Joyce and Sammy, for Gino and Dean, for Sue and Dolores and Betty, and for all who are on our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God, our hope, you promise eternal life to your beloved children. We remember with gratitude those who have lived and died in faith. Grant that we may also dwell with you in everlasting peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, O God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you in a way you and they are most comfortable.
invite you to stand. Please join with me in our offertory and make sure this is turned up because it's going to be quiet. Um, we will be using this throughout our Lenten time, Create in Me. together. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks, thanks. and praise. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. It was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food. The body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The things of God for the gathered people of God. Come and taste and see that God is good. I would invite the congregation to be seated. Please come forward through our center aisle. I'll place a wafer, the body of Christ, in your hand. And then please come proceed to our communion assistant and pick up a cup, either with wine or grape juice, whichever is most appropriate for you. And then place that empty cups in the containers on the far end of the pews as you go back to your seats by the side aisle. Our elements are gluten-free if that is of concern to you. This is Christ's table. It is one of abundance that God is waiting to shower upon you. Come.
I invite you to stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life, amen. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. We close singing together, God who's giving knows no ending.
loved wanderer, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, and to speak of your faith. And when this world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. You are called. You are blessed. In both your ups and your downs, you, are, you always belong to God. Go now in peace, trusting that good news. Thanks be to God.